Okay, today I'm in Mayfair with Paris Smith. Thank you very much, Paris. Paris is the CEO of Pinnacle Bookmakers, a yeah. global organisation. Um, can you just give us a little bit of your background, please, Paris? Um, I have been in the industry for 25 years now. Um, I started out just taking bets. Um, I was happened to be in Antigua and, um, and I needed a job, so I met somebody who happened to start Worldwide Telesports, which was one of the first sports books, and um, it was a neat experience because that gentleman was the, one of the pioneers of the industry. So I learned a lot and, um, and basically started taking bets and the business grew very, very quickly. And then um, within a year, I was the marketing director and shortly thereafter the vice president. And we set it up not just like a bookmaking operation, but more of an or of a company where we, it was very departmentalized. Um, one of the neat things about that company was we were, we had the majority of female staff. So at the time in the Caribbean, all the bookmakers were bringing in bookies from Vegas or wherever they came from, and um, and we focused on customer service, um, training, lots of intense training. And we had these phenomenal female staff on the phone. At one point, I think we had about 150, 60 people, of which uh, three were men and one was the owner. The other two were IT. So, you know, we have always just come from that um, background of, you know, focusing on customer service more than the bookmaking side. Okay, so are you sort of tired about being asked about being a female bookmaker and uh, should the industry have moved on a bit from asking those questions? I'm guilty of it myself now asking you. Yeah. Um, no, I, uh, I never think of it, the fact that I'm a female. Um, I've always had the luxury, I've had, um, I've worked for three amazing groups. Um, the first gentleman that I was talking about, he was very specific. Um, he wanted women, he trusted women more. And um, then the second company that, when I came into Pinnacle, um, they were very focused on having somebody that could multitask and manage some extremely brilliant people. It's not always easy. Um, and then, you know, the, the new majority shareholder, Pinnacle, um, he also, you know, he loves the fact that I'm a female. So we, I never think about it. Um, I do find that when I have struggled and people have been, you know, a bit challenging or even potentially disrespectful, um, it wasn't, I don't think it's because I was a woman I think it's because maybe they were, uh, they didn't understand what they were doing. They had their own insecurities. So, you know, I'm assuming that men have the same issue where, um, you know, they're, they go up against somebody that's more challenging. And I just never thought of it. It's because I'm a woman. I've always thought because maybe they just didn't understand. But right, now you said you, you started taking bets. Well, where did the interest in bookmaking come from originally? Um, I needed a job, really. And I was in Antigua and I couldn't find a job. It's a very unique island and you had to be local in most places to get a, a lower entry job. So um, I met this guy who owned a, a sports book and he said, yeah, my friend, he's from America and he's looking for females to answer phones. I said, for what? <laughs> this was at a different time. And, um, and he said, for sports betting. I thought, oh, I was a basketball player in college. Um, you know, I dealt blackjack, so I understood gambling. I thought I can do this, and that's how it started. So it wasn't really the passion. I have a very deep, deep passion of sports because that's what I grew up with: playing basketball, volleyball, um, every sport. So um, you know, the passion for the sports was there, but for betting, I'm not a better. I've never been a better, and that was one of the things that um, that really attracted the the Pinnacle Group to hire me. And where did you grow up? I grew up in North Dakota. I uh, have a very amazing childhood, amazing family. Um, my grandfather was a politician, so you know I always had that very diplomatic approach and the ability to um, speak with people. When I was like five years old, he taught me, you know, if I don't introduce you to somebody, it's because I don't know their name. So say your name and ask them their name. And you know, just little things like that. Wherever we'd go, he was, you know, kind of a big deal. Um, and uh, yeah, I learned a lot from him. 
Now, the Pinnacle's come of a, a huge way since its inception. I mean, what do you attribute to that? I think the innovation of Pinnacle has always been, it started with the innovation, and then you know the integrity and the brand that has really driven um, the whole model. Um, one thing, I was a competitor of Pinnacle, and at one point, um, I think the largest number of payouts that we were giving to clients were going to Pinnacle. And it was so frustrating. I would say, anybody who wants a withdrawal, send them to me, I want to ask them. I'm like, where are you sending, you know, to Pinnacle. And, um, and then I would say, why are you sending your money to Pinnacle? Everybody bets there, all my friends bet there. And I'm like, why? Well, they have low juice. I'm like, well, I don't know if that's sustainable. Well, fortunately it is sustainable. And, um, but it is, you know, it was a, a big risk that Pinnacle took. It was a big investment and they, um, not, you know, it's been, well, thus far, it hasn't really been repeatable as yet. Now, you mentioned that uh, juice, this reduced margin pricing model. Yeah. Um, so, to attract customers, rather than offer bonuses and freebies, you put up just a very yeah. tight margin and offer them good value. Now, did the customer base have to be a certain size before that was feasible, or did you just take a punt and think, right, we'll do that and see if we can get the customers? Yeah. I think in the very early days before I joined, um, part of the way to offset that was to bet out as well. So they were able to get that player base and sustain the business. And it, it didn't take very long, it was you know, a couple of years, but it was a, a very deep investment and a risk. But that's you know, the type of people that they were. Now you, if my research is correct, you, bet, uh, you take bets in over 100 countries and in 19 languages. Now how much of a logistical nightmare is that or is it not? It is um, payments, languages, localization, you know, all of those things. Um, we're, you know, we're almost like a 20 year startup because we've just celebrated 20 years last year. And, you know, to go into a market with this amazing model that has just worked, um, it took us a while to understand you can't just go. You have to go in, understand the market, understand the players, the language. Um, you know, of course, the payment options is the number one, um, but it's uh, you know the different marketing avenues that you can do, uh, making sure that they have the specific product, all of those things. It's um, it's not a logistical nightmare, but we have been focusing on country manager approach. Okay, and another thing that I've I read that Pinnacle has often been seen as quite sort of secretive. You didn't want to tell people how many how many people you employ, that sort of thing. Was there? Was there a practical reason for that or was it just to keep some mystique about the firm? Um, it was just the personality of the organization. Um, you know, very humble people. So, you know, we were just doing our thing. We didn't really feel like it was uh, important to share that information. Now, um, with the new ownership, we have a different approach and um, we're very proud of what has been created and we're happy to share the story. Okay, now you, you've operated casino betting since 2004. So it's a few years after the, you know, after you sort of started up. Was that because the public confidence in internet betting was still a little low until that point, or for any other reason? Um, the casino has never been our strong point. We're now just focusing on that. But you know, just the internet overall. You know, um, back in the days of phone betting, um, we, we used to actually transfer the players and. Um, you know, the owners would literally speak to the clients, explain to them how to get the internet, offer to send them a computer set up, ready to go, because what we did to transition people from and give them that confidence from the phone to the internet was if you bet on the phone, you bet you got 110 to win 100. So it was a higher VIG. And, um, and then, of course, you know, if you're a larger better, you know the value and you're happy to go online. And that's how we transitioned everybody over. And after I started in 2006, um, I think it was like 2008, we completely turned off all the, the phone betting. Okay, now fast forwarding to the two, um, 2010 eSports. Now we've been hearing a lot about eSports in some of my interviews recently. Uh, in 2010 eSports was your seventh largest market, once again, if my research is correct. Mm -hmm. And in 2018, they were your fourth. Um, how long before they become the top? And are they sort of bigger in certain areas? It is very global. It's 24-7, 365. Esports is so unique. 
Um, the player base is also very unique. When we started, um, our training director is a esports, um, almost a legend in his own way, uh, through um, Magic: The Gathering, and he, you know, we were talking about that innovation with a pinnacle, and we hadn't really done anything new, and he thought, I'm gonna put up some esports, twenty-five dollar max bets, just playing around with it. Um, and he, you know, he has a deep passion for it and along with a number of our traders. So, you know, it's a, it's a sports book that has like a heartbeat of esports. So, um, they, they started it and it took off and it kept rolling and moving and it was pretty brilliant the way they, they positioned it. And I hear you, you the bets have gone up a lot since then. Oh yes. Yes. The limits are much, much higher and, um, and the amount of product that we offer is really extensive so right now we're focusing on the data and um, you know and just providing the best uh, the best product to the player we're looking to have an esports specific website um, we have a, right now esports is a focus and we have a lot of investment going into esports it's our that's the largest um, base of people that we have in our organization is esports team and is it going to be your number one market at some point do you predict um, um, you know, it, it's, it has the potential. It's absolutely massive, the, the opportunities within the market. Um, and like I said, because it's global, uh, there's countries that we don't take bets from, the UK and Germany, and those are massive markets for esports, but we still happen to you know, do quite nicely without those key markets. US, we don't take any bets, um, so esports is huge in the US. So it's going to be interesting. We're looking at ways if, if we can um, find an opportunity to, to gain that market share. And are there any punters that are a bit sharp and they sort of beat you on it? Um, there are some very, very talented esports bettors. Um, you know, I think, well, the, the top ones would obviously bet with us because of the, the limits. Um, but you know, we you, just as in all the other sports, we utilize the information to make our numbers stronger. And I did read that um, you sponsored drone racing in Hawaii. Is that the next big thing, or is it a novelty? <laughs> you ne I never say never. Um, everybody thought esports was you know kind of laughable, um, but yeah, it, that's an interesting one. And drones are just getting more and more popular. So we'll have to wait and see.